uh, happy new year. Happy new year to everyone. So I would like to congratulate you on your acceptance to, to McGill. I want to welcome you to this exciting place. We'll start with our chair. All right. Hi. Um, thank you, Professor Mwale. Um, and I'll, I'll just uh, again uh, echo your, your good wishes for Happy New Year and your congratulations to our incoming students. Um, I think decision choosing your graduate studies program in our department. I'm very proud of our faculty um, and the work that um, um, they do in research and in education. Um, I think there's a, a ton of exciting uh, projects going on that to get involved in, as well as uh, getting involved in student life um, and making the most out of uh, this opportunity on the next step of your uh, training and development towards uh, what I'm sure will be rewarding. And uh, so um, I'm I'm uh, always available by email if you have questions. But I know that uh, uh, we have great resources in Professor Mwale, uh, Professor Barillet, uh, and uh, all the program leads and professors that uh, we have involved in the program, as well as um, all of our staff, uh, many of whom you see uh, participating today. So congratulations again, and I wish you all the best in your studies. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Feldman. Uh, a word from our Dean, uh, Dr. Josephine Nabatanglo. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, it's really nice to have you uh, join us. Uh, we're delighted. We didn't think we would still be in the middle of a pandemic, actually, you know, when most of you were applying and uh, confirming your applications uh, in the beginning of fall. Uh, we really thought we'd be out of this, but we're continuing and we've shown that we can do the research remotely or in person very carefully and very safely. Uh, but I think we all have to be optimistic that we're gonna get out of this uh, and you're joining a really great uh, department. So take advantage of everything uh, in your program. And also at McGill, we have a lot of support and a lot of workshops on professional development, on academic development. Uh, everything is on Zoom. It's, you know, video conferencing and so on. But we've shown that we can deliver this. So do take advantage of uh, the support uh, that we offer you. And my office has actually an associate dean who is uh, dedicated to the faculty of uh, Medicine and Health Sciences, uh, Lorraine Shalifer, and she's going to be the next one talking uh, after me uh, to tell you what type of uh, support she offers at the central level. So welcome again. Thank you very much, Dr. Navatanglo. Uh, Lorraine? Hi, it's good to sort of see you. To, it would be more fun in person, but there you go. And besides, it's really, really cold out. So what I'd like to do is to just introduce the, uh, as myself as the Associate Dean for uh, Experimental Surgery. You can contact me at, in the Associate Dean resource account or directly at lorraine.chalafortmail.ca if you have issues. I'm hoping that you will not have any issues. GPS tries very hard to make a lot of information available on the website. You can then look at it 24 seven whenever you get the urge. There is a wealth of information on your role and your boundaries in your supervision, how to be a supervisee. You should also look at what your supervisor should do because it's always good to know, you know what their boundaries are as well. Most of the time, I think what can cause some issues is if the expectations of you as a trainee and then the supervisor don't necessarily jive. So what you should do is talk to your guy. You talk to your supervisor, you know, what hours do they really expect you to be in? You know, what kind of reports do they want? Uh, what kind of meetings? You know, how do you prepare? Do you want notes? Do you want meeting notes later? You know, ask the questions rather than leave it up for grabs. Um, there's a lot, graduate life can be stressful. There's a lot of free help that McGill will give you. There's a program uh, called Keep Me Safe. It's available 24 seven. You can just have the app on your phone and chit chat with that in the language of your choice. 
there's a wellness office. You can also talk to the Dean of Students. And there was something new today that I learned about, which was the Wellness Together Canada. And by the way, did I mention that all of these are free? Um, the other thing you should do is look around you. This is your cohort. These are your buds that who are going to be the ones who will listen to your talk before you give it, who will listen to you. Maybe it didn't go so well. How can you fix it up? Um, they'll, they can you, you know, help you out in so many ways with your studies, with your professional life, with your work-life balance. Um, I would suggest that you at all times try and be kind to your cohort and be kind to your supervisor because a good lab, uh, well, healthy, conversial, socializing lab, you'll get more work done. It'll be more fun. And uh, again, it'll make your experience at Miguel so much better. Um, I think that you've picked a great place. Um, experimental surgery is very innovative. Um, I think that you're going to have a terrific time here and I wish you the best. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor Amy Ryan uh, will join us later. Uh, will speak to, to us in a, in a couple of uh, minutes. So our next uh, is our associate chair, uh, uh, Professor Barley. Hi, welcome everybody. I think I'm going to be talking to you a little bit later on about innovation, but I decided to echo um, the welcome that you've received from everybody else. And um, I just pre-warn you, I guess, that your time here will, will pass extremely fast. It might not seem like it at the time, but please do take full advantage of all the opportunities that people um, are working uh, at the university and in the department to provide for you. So I hope you enjoy yourselves here and you come out better people and certainly more knowledgeable about um, experimental surgery and uh, uh, affiliated sciences. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Barrett. So I'm uh, Faxon Mwale. I'm the graduate program director. Uh, so I would like to introduce you to our team. Uh, so this is our team. Uh, you'll be uh, talk a lot with uh, 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 Sharon, Sharon Turner, uh, Misha, and uh, the Terry. Does uh, is a chief multimedia technician. Uh, with, and then we have got um, Elish, uh, who's the coordinator. Laura helps us with the um, crunching the numbers and. Uh, uh, Dr. Michael Grant. So uh, Sharon is gonna give you some uh, things uh, to do, talk to you about uh, some things to do, uh, Sharon. Sharon? Okay, let's start again. Another warm welcome to you here. And here's a few little uh, items that you should be aware of. You need to verify Minerva that all your required documents are sent to service point. This will ensure that your file is complete and up to date. Tuition fees, please make sure that you pay them on time so you avoid any late charges. And these are to be paid via Minerva as well. We send out notices concerning registration dates and the ad drop period. I believe you should have received these already. Take note of them. If for any reason you didn't get the ad drop, let me know. I'll resend it to you again, not a problem. Direct deposit information. This should be updated on Minerva. This is important for any funds or any awards that you are entitled to receive at Miguel. Our website, Experimental Surgery website, check it often. There's a lot of updates on there, as well as notices that are sent to your email. Scholarships can be applied for through the uh, Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Services site and ours information there as well. And the completion of the Academic Integrity Tutorial. You'll see that note indicated on your transcript. That has to be completed. I believe it could block your registration. So have a look, make sure you've done that. Please. Next slide. And these are other little important notes. 
you'll be contacted by us through your McGill email only, not through your personal ones. And for registration, you must be registered for every term, even if you've completed your courses. If you have completed your courses, then what you do is you just register for the particular term only. You have to remain registered full time until you graduate. And here you can see the minimum and maximum times that are you need to be registered for in each program. If by chance you exceed these, then your status changes to time limitation, and that will prevent you from registering. So that's it. If you have any questions, you know, my email address, feel free to send me a message anytime. Now I'd like to introduce Ida Darish, who is our VP Academic in our Student Society. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many new students. Uh, you know, we're all very excited to have you here. Um, so just to kind of tell you who we are. Um, so we're, we're the council and we try to, you know, make your experience in experimental surgery as fun and as uh, fruitful and as interesting as possible. And so we hold a lot of different types of social events. We hold academic workshops. Um, you might have just received an email with a list full of different kinds of resources that you can use um, to further your professional uh, skills and so on. So we're really hoping that you'll kind of take advantage of that. And if you have any questions or any concerns at all, um, we do send emails periodically with our contact information. So please don't, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. We're always happy to help in any way that we can. And uh, just to kind of introduce the different members of our council. So there's Matthew as our president, myself as VP ACAD, um, VP internal, Oliver, he's really great. He organizes a lot of really fun events. And I would really say stay on the lookout for some cool events, um, even though, you know, COVID is hitting us really hard. Um, we are going to try to have some kind of, um, you know, outdoor socially distant event and also a lot of online events um, for us to have fun together. And for VP External, Chrisanne, VP Finance, David. Again, keep your eyes peeled for some really cool clothing orders um, that are going to come in very soon. VP Communications and Sophie and Jeremy, ombudspeople, so Anita and Shrita, who are always there to listen to any of your concerns. And finally, uh, the Health, Wellness, Equity and Diversity representative, Ms. Ghana. So we're also going to be holding some uh, wellness events in this semester. So just be on the lookout for those emails. Um, we really appreciate it when you, when you guys show up to our events. We're always very happy to um, see you. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my spiel. And this is kind of just a little glimpse at what had happened, you know, when before COVID, when we were in person. So we had some really cool events, for example, uh, Research Day, which is still going to be a blast this year when it's going to be, um, even if it's going to be online. So it was a great success last year, and we're hoping for uh, just as big of a turnout and success this year. And uh, yeah, so we hold a lot of, as I've said, workshops, and we're very excited uh, to have you. So um, yeah, these are kind of our contact uh, info. So you can, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, you name it. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out in any way that you can. Um, and we're very excited to hear from you and follow you on your experience in experimental surgery. Thanks a ton. Thank you very much, Ida. Uh, Laura. Thank you, Ida, for presenting the Graduate Student Society. So now we start our overview of all our programs, starting with the non-thesis Master of Science directed by Dr. Faxon Mwale. The program is based primarily on academic coursework and shorter projects, providing a great opportunity for training in specific areas. So uh, the course non-thesis master uh, consists of 45 credits. 21 credits must be obtained from required courses. For this reason, we advise you to register at these courses first. We also have complete, uh, um, you, you also have to complete complementary courses, 21 credits and elective three. So you can find a full list of this on the e-calendar or on the link below. So getting back to our um, the research project, uh, it's one of the important required courses. It's 6 to 2, X to 6 to 2. And it's a research project over two semesters. For these courses, the involvement of curriculum director, it's required. So here it's a list 
of our all curriculum directors. And also at the link below, you have a list of all available projects. Please check that list. And after that, find your projects that it's on your uh, interest. Depending on, the, uh, on your interest, you'll be assigned by the curriculum director to an advisor and his project. This, on the next slide, you'll, you can uh, check online on the link below. It's the tracking form for this uh, course. Please go and uh, see how we go. it's gonna be done, the evaluation. You have four evaluations in total, plus the final one where it's the uh, your project with the dates and the deadlines. So all these uh, forms are, are available. Just go there and see. The two course coordinator, it's myself and Misha. If we have you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Now, there are some frequently asked questions. So please, uh, Eilish. The first frequently asked question is, as a non-thesis student, is the EXSU 622 D1 and D2 project a requirement? Yes, it is mandatory for the non-thesis students. We encourage you to complete this in the first year. Considering that you are registered for the winter, I, uh, I recommend and we recommend you to register starting from the, from the fall session 2022. And as a non-thesis student, can I register for the EXSU 623 project before the 622 project? No, we want our students first to complete the 622 project. And if you wish so, you can do the 623 after. And last frequently asked question is, if I transfer to the thesis stream, can credits from the EXSU 622 project be carried over? No, given that X2, X2, 622 is dedicated to non-thesis courses, credits cannot be transferred to the thesis stream. So now Michael Grant, uh, Dr. Michael Grant will present our uh, summer internship program. Uh, thank you, Laura. So making the transition from graduate studies to the workforce can be quite challenging. So if you'd like to experience what it's like to work in industry, Experimental Surgery offers two medical in technology internship courses, EXSU 501 and 502. These courses offer a chance to develop transferable skills in the workforce and include uh, cross-cultural and cross-disciplinary uh, communication, teamwork, as well as time management. Each course totals approximately six credits, and you can register for either 501 or both 501 and 502 consecutively. The courses are for a duration of six weeks or 37.5 hours with one of our industrial partners. Thank you. So next, uh, Dr. Molly will be discussing our core programs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike, uh, Laura, uh, everyone, Sharon, uh, Elish, uh, that's really wonderful. Uh, Ida, really great. So, um, so uh, the, the highest degree offered is the PhD. I'll talk about that later. Uh, so we have got the core stream, which is uh, uh, experimental surgery. And, uh, and we have some really exciting uh, concentrations. Um, we've got uh, surgical innovation uh, that Dr. Barnett will talk about, uh, surgical uh, education, um, uh, Professor Hurley is going to talk about, and then we have got global surgery. We've got uh, digital health. These are very exciting uh, concentrations indeed, as you can see. And then we've got surgical uh, outcomes. Next slide. So for the thesis, uh, we, we, there's a tracking system. We have an advisory chairperson. So this person, the chairperson will be assigned to you. Uh, by the department uh, to chair your, your research advisory committee. And so there's a selection of a minimum of two additional committee members. And so uh, the one who does these arrangements uh, is you. Uh, so it's required to convene the meeting. So this is the responsibility of you and your supervisor. The committee uh, is there to monitor the progress of your project and it functions as a resource. So they are there to help you 
Uh, so it's important that you interact with uh, the committee. Now, the first meeting must be held within three months of the beginning of, uh, of your program with your supervisor and the, the, and the chair. Now, the, the subsequent uh, meetings, you are basically required to meet with your full advisory committee for a minimum of at least once a year until you graduate. Uh, so this is very, very important. Uh, we have a, a, a tracking form that can be completed uh, for these meetings, uh, which is uh, available at uh, this website. Now, uh, so you have a total of 45 credits for the master's uh, science uh, uh, thesis. So 30 credits basically go to the thesis courses and you're remaining with 15 credits. And so you have got a uh, required course, uh, uh, that, that's the uh, knowledge management. And then you can choose uh, three credits from the statistics uh, uh, courses. And then you have got nine credits that you get from the complementary uh, courses. Next slide. Now you can fast track from a master's uh, to PhD too. Now who can do this? Uh, students who have shown superior performance. Uh, what happens is that uh, uh, what you have to do is that the supervisor sends a letter of intent uh, to me and um, there's an exam, which is a fast track exam that is required. And after the exam, you have to, after completion of the exam, you make sure you notify the GPC and you submit your application to your apply. Um, now you should please note that admission deadlines also apply to fast track applications. Now, uh, the, we, we require that you have a, a strong academic record, so CGPA of, uh, of le not less than 3.5 in order to fast track. And there has to be strong evidence of probable successful completion of appropriate research for the doctoral level. You should complete a minimum of two full-time terms in the master's program and up to a maximum of four full-time terms. Uh, in terms of the exam, um, you have an exam committee, the supervisor, members of your research advisory committee, and you have to add two additional, minimum of two additional members. Now, for the fast track exam, this is organized by you and your supervisor in consultation with uh, the, the advisory committee. You should submit a progress report to the, to the transfer exam committee at least two weeks before the, uh, the exam. Uh, in terms of the format, you have about 20 minutes presentation, which is followed by a question period. Uh, now for the PhD. So the PhD is quite different from a master's. Uh, so it's a, a, a thesis for the doctoral degree. So this must constitute basically original scholarship and a distinct uh, contribution uh, to knowledge. That's very, very important. Next uh, slide. So one of the things that you, is every PhD uh, student is required is to pass this uh, comprehensive exam. And, uh, and you have got those credits uh, there, but let me, let's talk about this comprehensive exam. So next slide. So, they, you, so this is to be taken within 36 months of enrollment in the PhD program and 24 months if you fast track from the masters. So the, in terms of the committee, uh, you have a research advisory committee plus two to three additional members and chaired by uh, the committee chairperson. This normally lasts around two hours. So the candidate must receive a pass. Uh, sometimes it's a, so a pass in order to, uh, to, uh, to be permitted to continue in the PhD uh, program. And after you complete the exam, uh, you have to inform the GPC, uh, you have to confirm that make your records reflect that you passed the, the comprehensive uh, uh, exam. And so sometimes you can have a conditional pass depending on what the committee uh, says, uh, 
example, that is required to do uh, some things that they found were lacking during the exam. So next. Uh, now, uh, in what, so what, what about the format of this comprehensive exam? There's a review of the progress uh, made in the research project. So you present this uh, takes about 20 to 30 minutes and then it's followed by uh, uh, questions from the committee. And then the second part is a critical assessment of a research article in the field. So the student and the supervisor choose about uh, three to four uh, articles. And then these are submitted to the advisory committee. And so the advisory committee uh, chairperson in consultation with the exam uh, committee members, then so they select one for the assignment. Uh, so which consists of two parts, a written report, which you submit at least 10 to 14 days before the exam and 20 to 30 minute uh, oral presentation of the article. So this is all followed by uh, questions. Next. So it says Misha. Misha, are you there? Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about seminar series. We have seminars via Zoom starting from next Tuesday, the 18th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Um, the goal of the seminars uh, is, other than bringing to you known researchers who present their research, um, these seminars also give students a chance to present their own uh, project and to be able to have a short discussion session with specialists in the domain um, during the uh, Q&A period. Um, the format for the seminars is um, we would start at 1 p.m. with one to two student uh, presenters and each student will give five to 10 minutes um, talk, followed by the main speakers who will give a 45 minute presentation. After that, everyone in the audience can ask questions to the, uh, to the speakers. Um, on the slide, you see um, pictures of all the uh, winners from best speakers from um, 2020 and 21 seminars. So again, in April, we will announce to you um, the best student presenters for the 21-22 academic year. Um, first, second, third places for in the three categories, uh, master non-thesis, thesis, and PhD. Uh, if you, you know, would like to know what um, seminars is uh, all about, you know, there's a sample of uh, past presentations. We record it and post them on our website. I can post the link in the chat later, or you can just send me an email uh, after the, uh, the orientation. Um, but, oh yes, and attendance to the seminars is mandatory. I will send out reminders, but please remember to save Tuesday, 1 to 2.30 PM in your schedule so that you will be able to attend. And I think that's all for me. Um, next, I would like to introduce you to our Associate Dean, Dr. Amy Ryan. Uh, Professor Ryan, are you there? Okay, so I think it's not. So let's move to uh, Professor Barlett, uh, talk about uh, innovation, uh, digital health innovation and surgical innovation. Thank you, Dr. Mwali. And um, if any of you are uh, registered in the uh, innovation concentration, congratulations on that excellent choice. I think you probably know a little bit about the program or else you would not have um, selected this concentration. But basically, we have um, a kind of module of three courses that um, focus on a design thinking approach to um, innovations that, you know, the difference between, uh, I guess, science and innovation is scientists try to understand, you know, how, how something happens and innovators try to figure out how they can use that to, to create something of value. Um, our program is very, very hard work. It's very intensive. Um, it's not it's not a great choice for people that just want some credits and move on it requires a, a lot from people however 
it's one of the few uh, graduate programs in Canada where you come in with nothing, no projects, no supervisor, no no direction, and and it's possible to leave with a funded company. And this is uh, happening. Uh, excuse me. I'm currently on quarantine with my two year old. Um, this happens more and more often. And even if you don't particularly want to um, have your own company, at least understanding how the medical technology business works is extremely useful uh, going forwards. So if any of you are listening to this and going, oh, why didn't I select uh, surgical innovation? Then you still, you still can change if you would like to join this program. Indeed, you can change right up until September when this innovation module gets going. So um, if you're interested in it, you can have a look at the uh, which courses and things you need to do. And if you have any questions, be happy to um, fill you in on, on how it works. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Oh yeah, I should mention that <laughs> there are certificates and diplomas. Um, it's possible if you're, for example, a PhD student to join the innovation um, uh, modules and get a, an additional graduate certificate. And if indeed you do not particularly want to do a, um, a, a thesis masters, you are able to do a, a, a diploma version. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Jason Hurley. Uh, Jason? Okay, so I think we're gonna move to uh, so, so. Sorry, uh, Professor Jason Harley is here, but we just have a little bit of trouble hearing you. Okay, Jason, are you here? We can't hear you, Jason. Uh, can you unmute? You are muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So yours, Jason. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, so if you can hear me, can someone else confirm? It sounds like Derek can hear me. Yeah, we okay, can great. hear you. Um, apologies, I'm on a new computer um, and at home, <laughs> as many of us are. Um, so I'll just talk very briefly about surgical education. Um, really what this program is about and the research we're doing in this program is to help us understand best practice for training the next generation of surgeons as well as supporting the continuing development of practicing surgeons. So with this, we examine a range of different kinds of education outcomes, including skills acquisition and learning curves, but also the role of technologies such as artificial intelligence and virtual reality in supporting training. Surgical education is also keenly interested in both technical and non-technical skills. Some of these include communication, collaboration, and leadership, and are in line with the Royal Colleges of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada's CanMeds framework, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Simulation training also plays a prominent role in surgical education, and we have a fantastic opportunities for getting involved with simulation in our department, which I can support as both curriculum director and director of research at the Steinberg Simulation Center for Interactive Learning. Ultimately, we're passionate about surgical education because better preparing surgeons means better patient outcomes, including less medical errors. A well-trained surgeon can also support psychological safety, in working environments and better patient engagement, which once again, supports better patient outcomes. Um, as I think uh, Dr. Molly was uh, mentioning, um, we have uh, both thesis and non-thesis iterations of the surgical education program. Um, I think we have a thesis displayed here. Um, I think the non-thesis programs are really aligned across all the different types. I think it's really a question of, um, there, there are some probably program differences as well, which might have been displayed a little bit earlier. Um, if you are a non-thesis student in the surgical education program, um, please do contact me, um, especially if you're having a hard time identifying someone uh, to help supervise your research project. And I'll be happy to help you identify someone. 
um, or potentially if there's research projects in my lab that you might be interested in, um, we'd be happy to explore uh, that as well. I think that's those are the key points I wanted to mention for today. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, Professor Fiore, can I talk about uh, surgical outcomes? Uh, yes, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, I have a few slides. Let me see if I can. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. All righty. So hello everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Giulio Fiori. I'm an outcomes researcher and assistant professor in the Department of Surgery. And I'm currently, currently the director of the thesis program with concentration on surgical outcomes research and also one of the curriculum directors of this master's program. So in this very brief presentation, I'll highly focus on our thesis program, but I'm sure that some of the information provided will also be useful to students in the non-thesis program. So our master's program with concentration on surgical outcomes research is a new kid on, on the block, as we had our first cohort of students starting last year in the fall of 2021. And in case you wonder what I mean by surgical outcomes research, this is an emergent field of research focused on the results or consequences of surgical and perioperative care interventions. Experimental surgery always had many students conducting projects focused on surgical outcomes, and this number increased even further in recent years. However, we never had a master's concentration that was tailored to the training needs of these students. So we are all very excited to finally being able to bridge this gap in our program. And our mission with this concentration, the, this master's concentration on surgical outcomes research is to offer students with world-class training in surgical outcomes research and also provide the knowledge and skills required for students to start a successful career as a surgical outcomes scientist or clinician scientist. So, important and why is this program so exciting? According to data from the WHO, over 300 million surgeries are conducted in hospitals around the world every year, approximately 2.5 million only here in Canada. And although surgery is recognized to be an essential component of healthcare, the complications and post-operative morbidity are quite common, occurring in about 15% of all patients undergoing major surgery. And a large proportion of these complications are considered to be preventable by optimizing perioperative care. And as you can imagine, these post-operative complications pose a major burden to the healthcare system, with studies showing an up to five-fold increase in costs compared to patients without a post-operative complication. So in response to these very grim statistics, the WHO deems that improving the quality and safety of surgical care is a global public health concern. And given this concern, of course, there is an increasing need for robust research aimed to assess and improve the outcomes of surgical patients, and also an increasing demand for scientists and clinician scientists who are skilled in the design, conduct, and critical appraisal of surgical outcomes research. So our master's concentration capitalizes on this emerging field as it is specifically tailored to the training needs of future surgical outcomes researchers. So in terms of our program uh, content, our master's concentration has a total of 45 credits. 33 of these credits are through required courses, including the 30 uh, thesis credits, as well as three credits coming from a new course named Surgical Outcomes Research Foundations. And in addition to these mandatory courses, students will also complete 12 credits of uh, complementary courses. At least six of these credits will be acquired through courses um, focused on research methods and biostatistics, which are, of course, key subjects in the field of surgical outcomes research. And through another six credits, the students will be able to pursue specific knowledge that is relevant to their research projects through elective courses. And these elective courses should be approved by their supervisor and their advisory committee. So now just taking a minute to focus on our, our new course on surgical outcomes research uh, foundations, which is one of the pillars of our concentration. 
this course will um, be offered starting from this winter and will be directed by myself and by Dr. Chelsea Gillis, um, who is research in the Department of Anesthesia. And the course will be taught, of course, by us and also by internationally renowned guest lecturers. The course will focus on traditional and modern approaches to, me to measure surgical outcomes and also contemporary strategies to improve post-operative recovery. And the list of our specific lectures and lectures are displayed here on the screen. As I mentioned, this course will be mandatory for students in the thesis program with concentration on surgical outcomes. But of course, the course is also open to students in the known thesis stream and also for students in other concentrations who wish to take this course. So on behalf of the Surgical Outcomes Research in uh, McGill's Department of Surgery, I wish to, uh, wish to welcome you all to the Experimental Surgery Graduate Program and looking forward to working together. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fiore. Um, the next. Uh... So in addition to the concentrations that have been previously talked about, um, there's an additional concentration that is called the Global Surgery Concentration, which is also a thesis program. Um, it is co-directed by Dr. Dan Duckelbaum and Dr. Tarek Rezek. And it has a number of required courses, including um, the standard research courses that come with thesis concentrations. Um, if you're curious to learn more, you can uh, go on the Department of Experimental Surgery website and there will be kind of a short description uh, that you can read to see if this is a concentration that you would enjoy. So now we will present a short video from Jan Walker, who is the fellowship administrator um, and uh, in charge of explaining kind of graduate funding and how you can go about uh, finding funding for your research. Hi, so um, thank you for um, inviting me. My name is Jan Walker and no, it's not Dr. Walker, but thank you, I appreciate that anyway. <laughs> um, Welcome to McGill University, everyone. Um, I'm here today to introduce to you graduate and postdoctoral studies graduate funding. So graduate funding has four major roles, and they are making sure that funding information is available for all of our graduate students, including international student funding, federal and provincial funding, sponsorships, and internships. We keep fair and transparent adjudication processes of all our centrally administered fellowships and awards from GPS fund competitions. We are also able to assist in the development and modification of policies regarding graduate funding and student eligibility, both internally to McGill and with outside agencies. And always, we give our voice to you to support and advocate for all of our graduate students with external agencies. Now, there are two principal types of funding, internal and external. I'll begin with internal funding. Now, this is financial support that is distributed by the university in different ways. All incoming students are automatically considered for and may be offered inter internal funding. However, some academic units may have their own respective funds. Central McGill funds come from different sources such as endowments, donations, government bodies, etc. Some faculties and academic units have their own opportunities that you may have to apply for. Be sure to discuss what opportunities are available for you with your graduate program coordinator. Most professors have research grants that they may use to help fund students under their supervision. Now, there may also be employment possibilities in your unit as a research or teaching assistant, for example. Note that these funds, note that funds received for these are considered salary for employment and are subject to the corresponding union's collective agreements. So McGill, McGill Central funds work like this. All monies come into one big pot. Using a formula, that pot is shared with each faculty. Each faculty uses their own formula and policies to, re to redistribute their share to their units, usually keeping a chunk at the faculty level as well. Now, each unit is then tasked with offering this to their students. You will see this in your offer of admissions letter. Now we have external funds, and this is where I work. These are monies awarded to students that come from external funding agencies. The most prominent are the Canadian Federal Research Funding Agencies, and the Quebec Provincial Funding Agencies. As you can see, 
Each level of government has three specific agencies. Each one of these agencies are direct, direct their funds for three different fields of research. A very important note is to be sure that you select the, co the correct funding, federal and or provincial agency that corresponds with your research. Now these awards must be applied for and our web pages have a ton of really important information and instruction for you. So please go and check us out. Anyone who submits an application to one of the provincial agencies are required to send the application number to their unit. A special note for students in the health sciences, which are you, that there are many agencies and foundations that offer student fellowships. Check them out. Google can be a really good friend at this point, as well as your supervisor. A very quick overview of our webpage for information on specific funding opportunities. Our main GPS funding page leads you to the following. A listing of funding opportunities that you can get to by first selecting your corresponding registration status then based on your program of study for the award citizenship and field of research you can find awards that you would be eligible for you can also meet and see the bios of some of our really prestigious uh, previous award winners you can get tips and tricks for creating really good proposals and winning applications by our going to our page maximize my chances, as well as find out how to get your payments on a page appropriately named Getting Paid. For international students, there are a couple of important sources of funding, and they may be sponsorships or DFWs. Now, sponsorships are agreements between GPS and an international funding agency. The agreements include co-funding by McGill with an international agency abroad. Sponsorships are restricted to incoming and first year students, and they usually cover tuition, international health insurance, and an annual living allowance. To see if we have a sponsorship agreement with an agency in your home country, please visit our website where you can find details on how to apply. DFWs, or Differential Fee Waiver. Now, this is an exemption of the fees charged to international students, the amount over and above what a Quebec resident student would pay. This does not include your international health insurance. DFWs come as a result of a bilateral agreement between Quebec and a foreign government. This is how it works. After their own selection process, a country will nominate their selected candidates to the Quebec government, who in turn will perform a final selection and inform the candidate and the university. Application steps for students include, first, determine whether there is a bilateral exemption for your country by consulting the list of countries that have established such agreements. You can find them by going to this link. This is a link to the Quebec Provincial webpage. If the country or affiliated agency does have a bilateral exemption, contact the appropriate authority for that country or agency, which you will find listed here. Now, do beware. Deadlines vary greatly country to country. So please go and check out this webpage as soon as possible. A couple of process of uh, the process for uh, funding competitions that are in that uh, we administer here at McGill. So first thing, always know your deadline. Talk to your units graduate office. Make sure that they don't have a deadline set for you earlier. Instructions, please read them. Read them more than once. Follow them. 40% of all rejected applications are simply due because somebody didn't follow an instruction. Please don't let that be you. Submit at the correct place and please submit on time. A late application equals no application. Your unit will make a pre-selection and nominate to GPS dependent upon their quota. All eligible and complete nominated applications will then go through an internal selection process here at GPS. Based on McGill's quota, selected applicants are then forwarded to the funding agency. A note that the final selection for the CGS Masters Awards are determined right here at McGill and are not forwarded to any agency. One of my favorite pages, getting paid. So, You've received either in the mail or an email saying that congratulations, you've been offered an award from this agency. Great. The agent, the notice of award also says McGill 
will administer the payment of this award. You sit back and you wait. Where's your money? Well, if you don't let anybody know that this that this award is for you, then there's nobody knows to pay it to you. So please, if you receive a notification that you have been offered an award from an external funding source, let your unit know. Note that tri-agency award payments are processed here by graduate funding. Most other external award payments are processed by your unit. When in doubt, email graduate funding and please remember to include your new McGill ID number. Include your McGill ID number in all your communications with us. Also, if it's concerning a new award, please include your notice of award. Remember that TA ships and RA ships are employment. So these opportunities are paid via payroll and also administered by your unit. Stipends offered from your supervisor come from their research grants, and again, processed by your unit. Now, to avoid delays, please make sure that you are registered for any term your award will cover before the start of that term. Submit any and all documentation to the appropriate unit or office. Example, your notice of award. Update your banking information and current mailing address on Minerva. Word of caution, when entering your bank account number, please make sure it's the correct bank account number. Yes, it happens. Somebody else could get your money. Yes, you will get it back, but it does take time. It's a hassle and stress, and it's your responsibility. So please just be careful of that. those numbers that you put into Minerva. Go and visit our webpage, Getting Paid. It'll have all the instructions and what documents ne you need to submit where and when. Oops, sorry about that. So, a note for international students, or all students, you must have a Canadian bank account for any award or employment payments that go to McGill. A note again, specifically for international students who may be arriving late due to immigration issues. You will not be able to receive payments until you have opened your Canadian bank account and updated this information on Minerva. Questions about this should be directed to your graduate program coordinator. Some links for you to uh, bookmark. Please, if you're gonna bookmark any of them, make sure that it's at least our main page. Everything else, can be linked to from there. Other resources for you, um, besides our Maximize My Chances skill sets, they have a great program called Would You Fund It? There's also the Grapples uh, Writing Workshop. And this link is um, uh, gives you tips for uh, writing a really good research proposal. You can meet our team. Our external funding team is Esther DeCorey, our fellowships officer, myself, Jan Walker, the fellowships administrator, and Edmundo Tilly, our student affairs coordinator. Our internal funding team, Lilia Eskelson, our graduate funding manager, Hannah Hu, the administrative and student affairs coordinator, and Quinter Pace, the student affairs coordinator. If you want to contact us, please use our graduatefunding.gps at mcgill.ca. Please do not email our um, personal inboxes. We don't have time to go and look at them. I haven't even thought about looking at mine today. Six pairs of eyes are on this graduate funding email, so please use that one and always include your McGill ID number. I suggest that you put the ID number in the subject line. It's easy for us to find and a lot of our questions, a lot of your questions will for us to answer are dependent on knowing what program you're in, what level you're in. So having your ID number just makes it easier for us to answer you, answer your emails in the um, in a very quick and efficient manner. So that ends um, my presentation for today. Once again, I wish you all the best and again, welcome. Okay, great. So the, uh, the dates that were shown for the webinars um, uh, for the past uh, September, uh, but you can uh, find the, the current updated uh, dates uh, on the website, or you can uh, email Jan and uh, her team. Uh, so, so um, Laura, you can.
So for the uh, great, great awards, so these are designed to provide funds to support uh, travel uh, to conferences or other scholarly meeting presentations. Uh, I realize that uh, we are in a pandemic and uh, there's not very much travel. Um, so uh, students may receive only one great award uh, per academic year. So only gr granted for the applicant's own research. And if there's no additional funding available for external uh, sources. So uh, we, we will be uh, back to action. So <laughs> not big worries at the moment, uh, we're going through a, a, a tough time, uh, but uh, there will be. So just so you're aware of these great awards. So the next slide. So there are uh, funding for travel, uh, regular graduate mobility awards. So these are funding for traveling, which are necessary for graduate research. Um, so there's also remote research and online workshops. Uh, so these projects in collaboration with international or out of province partner institutions can be eligible up to about $2,000. Uh, so these expenses uh, include uh, uh, up to five, you know, stipend the complement for up to $500 per month. Uh, so please uh, visit uh, that website. It will give you uh, a lot of information that could be very helpful. Next slide. Now, uh, so you have rights and responsibilities. And so these are the important resources that we include here uh, that can be very helpful uh, to you. Um, so next slide there. Uh, uh, Lauren, are you there? So one of the things that I uh, would like to alert you to is plagiarism. Uh, I wanted uh, the Associate Dean to, uh, to give you a little bit of talk about plagiarism. So we have uh, zero tolerance for pl plagiarism. Uh, so, so uh, please do, just don't plagiarize. You are not here to plagiarize. We have uh, uh, the department has a lot of resources to find out if something has been plagiarized. And uh, uh, if that happens, it has happened. Um, so it, it's quite a very serious case. And it's, uh, it's involved with, uh, at, with the associate dean, uh, Dr. Lauren Shalifo. Uh, so just don't plagiarize. The next slide. Uh, we also have zero tolerance for harassment. Um, so uh, sexual violence, uh, ha harassment of any sorts, just know that uh, we have got resources for you and there's a, a way that you can uh, file a report under McGill's policy against uh, um, uh, harassment. And, and there's a, a, a resource here, uh, which, you, uh, which is uh, it takes all of us. So visit the uh, text uh, all of us and you, you get a lot of information about harassment. So we have zero tolerance. Next slide, please. Now, the other thing is ethics in research. Uh, so just be aware of this. And I know that uh, you do take some courses uh, before. Uh, so the regulation on the conduct of research, uh, this is important as you do research uh, in the lab. Or, or, um, so it's very, very important that you are, you are aware of the regulations uh, on the conduct of, uh, of research. Next slide. Now we are in a pandemic and things have, uh, we, we thought we were getting better until we were hit by another punch from Omicron. So uh, it's important that uh, you are aware of uh, the rules as they change. They are mostly in flux. And uh, uh, this, you can visit uh, the McGill uh, website. And one thing you see is that uh, they are, according to where you are, it could be at the different hospitals and they follow those guidelines. Uh, so in, in Students at the moment, so this is updated from December 15. Uh, students should not come to a campus, 
including to in-person exams if you have COVID uh, uh, symptoms. So uh, accommodations for students if you need, if needed are requested by completing a form in Minerva. Uh, so there's, uh, as I said, a COVID-19 update on graduate activities during campus closure. So uh, we have all these links uh, that are changing as we go. Next slide. So um, and you should fill out the COVID-19 uh, uh, evaluation form on Minerva, uh, COVID case management self-evaluation, and what to do if you have COVID symptoms, a positive test, or have been in contact with somebody who has a, uh, had a tested positive. So there are all these guidelines <laughs> on the McGill website. We also updated uh, on our website, uh, thanks to Terry, who's been very helpful in keeping our website up to date. Um, so next slide. There are COVID-19 health guidelines that you should follow. Uh, so uh, you have to use uh, procedural uh, masks at all time, uh, and unless you are alone in a closed space. So you can remove the mask if you are eating and drinking, but should put on uh, them uh, immediately. If you cannot maintain physical distancing of at least one meter on out of, please wear a procedural mask. And it's important that you replace your, uh, your mask after every four hours of, of use. And the uh, university, the hospitals, uh, they provide these masks to all students, faculty, and staff uh, coming to, to campus. Uh, it's important that you are informed with all the regulations, when to stay home, preventing transmission, cleaning and disinfecting, uh, et cetera. Next slide. Now, the important thing is uh, get vaccinated. Uh, you are keeping not only yourself safe, but you are also keeping other people uh, safe. So this is very, very uh, important. So the single best protection that you can give against COVID-19 for, is for you and your loved ones. So there are high rates of vaccination, which is the best protection for, for our society. So basically get vaccinated and uh, get the booster shot. Next uh, slide. So oh. we do have some additional resources for um, graduate students. Uh, one of which is the Students Advocating for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, which is a bilingual committee um, whose goals are to support and build a community for underrepresented, marginalized and racialized students, um, to educate society within science and academia and to implement action through institutional change to ensure procedures are put in place that allow for sustainable change. Uh, this community, uh, this committee, sorry, um, has uh, the link for faculty support through Dr. Amy Ryan and Dr. Lloydy Majuska. Um, and uh, they're always looking for people to contribute and participate if ever that's something that you are interested in. And now we have a short video that talks about some of the resources that are offered to you. Welcome to McGill and congratulations to all of you who are starting your graduate degree. I'm Nicole and I'm a PhD student in Rehabilitation Science in the Faculty of Medicine. I'm going to introduce the essential resources that McGill has to support your success throughout your graduate degree. In fact, there are so many resources that it can be hard to know where to look to find them. To make it easier for you, we've created a website that organizes essential resources for your success in just three broad categories of academics, well being and student life, and careers and professional development. The link to the website is mcgill.ca slash first year slash graduate postdoctoral. On the website, select resources for success on the left hand side of the menu. It will show a list of resources describing what they do and how you can contact them. I'm going to highlight some of the resources in each of these categories. When you first think about your success as a graduate student, you probably think about your academic work. Under the Academics tab, you'll find links to several resources to support you. Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, or GPS, has essential information on funding opportunities, as well as preparing and submitting your thesis. 
Through GPS, you can also access pd.education, which is an online platform that provides resources, interactive webinars, and tools to help graduate students progress in and complete their degree. Another McGill service to support you is the Office for Students with Disabilities, or OSD. If you have documented disabilities, mental health illness, uh, chronic illnesses, or other impairments, whether they be permanent, temporary, or episodic, OSD can help you receive accommodations and support to meet your needs, including adaptive technology or connecting with a learning resources advisor. Under the Wellbeing and Student Life tab, you'll see a list of services offered to graduate students at McGill. Half of these services are offered by the university and the other half are offered by student groups. The Student Wellness Hub is where you access different resources for health and wellness, including counseling services, physician appointments, and programming by local wellness advisors. There are links here to the Virtual Hub, which describe the remote services available. Campus Life and Engagement is here to help you acclimatize, settle in, and find the people and services you need. They offer different programming to help connect you to resources and the community here at McGill. Under this tab, you'll also find student-run associations that offer services to graduate students. It's important to know about the Postgraduate Student Society, or PGSS. PGSS advocates for you, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, in meetings with the university. They also offer social opportunities, including virtual events and programming. Another student-led service is McGill Students Nightline, a confidential, anonymous, and non-judgmental active listening service. You can call if you need advice or just someone to talk to. as you help work through whatever you're feeling. Although you're just starting your degree, you're probably also thinking about where it's going to take you after graduation and what kinds of doors it will open. Under the Careers and Professional Development tab, you'll find links for Career Planning Service, or CAPS, which offers individual career advising and workshops to prepare you for the academic or non-academic job market. CAPS also hosts the My Future website where you can search for jobs and manage your career. You'll also find the link to Skill Sets, which offers over 200 professional development workshops and events every year specifically designed for graduate students. For example, there's Would You Fund It, which helps you develop a winning fellowship application, as well as workshop series to strengthen leadership skills. These events are designed to help you succeed in both your academics and your career. Lastly, I want to highlight that GPS created my path, which can help you manage all three of those domains to have a meaningful experience at McGill. My path's mission is to help students and postdocs pursue their goals using an individual development plan or an IDP. You can think of your IDP as a tailored roadmap that guides you from where you are now to where you want to be. So as you can see, wherever you're at in your trajectory as a graduate student, there are many resources that will guide and support your success here at McGill. I encourage you to learn more about these different resources at the website I just presented to you, mcgill.ca slash first year slash graduate postdoctoral. I'd like to wish you a wonderful, successful, and enriching graduate experience here at McGill. Paxton, I think Dr. Ryan is here. Yeah, so we, before we proceed, uh, a word from uh, Professor Ryan. Hello. Do you want me to go now? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, okay. you can go. <laughs> okay, right. So I will just, are you going? Uh, yeah, I'm looking for you. In there, yeah, or? okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry I'm sorry I was late I was I, I got double booked over uh over the at the start of this meeting with this another student presentation session so um so my name is Amy Ryan I am happy to be here today I just want to give you just a brief um 
I don't think I'll, I'll share any slides, I'll just speak. I'm the Associate Dean within the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. So I oversee the graduate programs within our faculty and I work in conjunction with graduate and postdoctoral studies and the Associate Deans there to provide oversight on graduate programs. Um, we take care of within my office. So I know when uh, Jan Walker was talking, she talked about different monies that flow through the university. So they flow from central through GPS, through my office, and then into experimental surgery where um, we give them out to you and then they're dispersed to the students to support your training and your um, stipends. There's money that comes for travel. There's money that comes to offset uh, fee with differential fees, as we discussed. Um, so we're sort of, we're your sometimes first contact beyond your department, but still within the faculty. Um, for things that are more administrative in, um, that need to be handled by GPS, those things are handled strictly by GPS, but but Lorraine Shalafour and I work closely together oftentimes on, on um, management of different issues. So, uh, not just bad things, but also for good things. So um, my door is always open to students. Um, usually we ask you know, students to, if you encounter problems, we hope none of you are gonna encounter any difficulties, but, but different challenges come up in, in your lives, especially during this time of pandemic, different stresses come up. Um, and so sometimes you just need another place to go and talk to. And so for that, my door is, is always open to students. Um, you can either come through to me through your program, or you, if you need to, you can contact me directly. And my email is just amy.ryan at mcgill.ca. Within the faculty, our vision is really that we're going to provide a supportive training environment to allow you to achieve your goals and your potential. And we're hoping to train you for both academic and non-academic careers. And I think this is particularly true in experimental surgery, which offers really a broad range of programs for the students. And we really view that even though you're graduate students and you're called students, that you're really junior colleagues and that you join our labs, our research groups um, as really fully functioning members that are gonna to contribute to the creation of new knowledge. And that as part of this, you also need time and space to develop your own um, professional skills, both hard and soft skills. And I know you've heard in some of the preceding talks about those. And I really encourage you to take advantage of those other opportunities that exist for you to, to look at an independent development plan to, um, when you sign that letter of understanding with your supervisor to think about it in terms of your own professional goals as well and how they fit in and how you work together on that. So within my office, our day-to-day -day activities are largely fo focused on um, supporting programs and development of programs and, and working with the different graduate programs. We also uh, oversee the, international, uh, the internal studentship competition. So that's a funding opportunity that comes up in the spring. There's also opportunities to win awards for publication. So we have two deadlines a year where you can submit your most recent uh, publication um, to be considered for a $500 award. Uh, we also then review all graduate programs. Um, primarily, we've done this from the level of programming itself, but we're looking at um, meeting with the student groups as well. I also have partnered with two student groups. One is the Graduate Student Health and Wellness Working Group that is um, working across the faculty through all programs to support graduate student health and wellness. And as well, we have a SAFE group, which is the students advocating for equity and diversity and inclusion um, that are really looking at those issues and how to support our graduate students um, during their times at McGill. We've taken a couple of initiatives over the past years to improve graduate training. Um, one is that letter of understanding, which is mandatory in all programs. And we really encourage you to use that as a real discussion point between supervisors and students to, so that you're both on the same page to start that conversation that allows you to discuss things that might be challenging, that you might disagree on, but that hopefully you can come to um, uh, a point where you can sort of work together and uh, so that both of you end up with what you feel you need from this supervisor trainee relationship. We've also are setting up harmonized stipends and those will be implemented starting in the fall of 2022. 
where students will receive a, a base as part of their funding package, both a base stipend as well as um, uh, their tuition covered on top of that. And we are trying to work towards improving access to support for student wellness. I think particularly during the pandemic, um, it's been challenging times for everybody. I think we're all feeling the stresses of that. Um, I'm hoping everybody's coming back a little bit rejuvenated after the break over the holidays, but it's definitely stressful times. And I think it's stressful for students, particularly when you're starting remotely, but it's also stressful times for supervisors who are you know, trying to work and manage research groups through this. And so we're trying to um, advocate for increased wellness support. And we're also um, working with the group to advocate for um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so if you're interested in either of those groups and you wanna be more involved, you can contact your own student society, but there's also information that gets sent out of my office. Um, with that, I really wanna wish you every success during your graduate program that you have really fulfilling research projects that, you, that enable you to make those discoveries that you're wanting to make, that allow you to really um, achieve your potential and um, take you down into sort of exciting roads of research, whatever that may be, whether it's you know fundamental research, clinical research, uh, biotechnologies, you know, education research, all of those things are open to you. And I really hope that you really have picked uh, great programs that will allow you to achieve your goals. So good luck to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ryan. Um, so before some, um, yeah, so uh, we would like to, if you have some questions, uh, just to give you this, uh, some of our course directors um, uh, in knowledge management, uh, one, knowledge management, two, uh, signal transduction, uh, trains in precision, oncology, surgical education, surgical innovation, biomedical research, statistics, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So um, because this is a small group, normally in the fall, we have a large group and we have uh, breakout rooms. Uh, but because this is a small uh, group, uh, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. But if you are, would rather uh, have a breakout room with uh, any of the people here, uh, we have a very talented uh, Terry uh, who can uh, get you into a breakout room that you can have a conversation. Uh, so normally before the uh, before COVID, we just all were in one, one room and had a conversation, students asked questions and uh, there were answers. Uh, but you have that, just so you know, you have that option. Uh, you can just send in a chat um, and uh, Terry will monitor that. And if you wanna go to a breakout room with, uh, with, with anybody uh, on this, uh, uh, feel free to do so, uh, but also, feel free to ask any questions to us and, uh, and we'll address uh, those questions. Otherwise, uh, as you, you know, if there are emails you can send and as we go forward, uh, you, you uh, feel free to, to ask any questions that you have. So I'd like to thank everybody who's participated and thank the students, uh, uh, welcome uh, to McGill and we look forward to interacting with you. So any, any questions, uh, please feel free. You can put the questions in the chat if you wish, or you can ask uh, directly. Uh, we have got a whole bunch of talented uh, scientists here uh, online.